So today we're going to just consider we love God, the first value. One verse, Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Everybody say, and with all your strength. Okay, let's say it better. Say, everybody say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Turn to your neighbor, the one that you like, and say, where is the love? Where is the love? Where is the love? Okay, let's, let's relax. <laughs> let's pray. Father, thank you for your glory. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your presence. We do not take you for granted, for you are a king, the king above all kings. So therefore, we worship you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can stop for now and then we'll come back. Yeah. Okay, so um, I, I grew up in an era where the boy showed up with a boombox playing romantic songs to the window of the girl that, that he liked. Uh, I, I grew up in the era where we passed notes from one end of the class all the way to the end of the class, and it had two options. Yes or no, do you want to be my girlfriend? <laughs> that was the play right there, straight up. Do you want to be, I've looked at you, you've looked at me, we know what's happening, just pick one. I grew up in a time where um, the, the climatic scene of a, a romantic movie was the boy and the girl running towards each other in slow motion and rain falling. It was always raining. They, they, were, they were talking and she might be in the library and she comes out and it was not raining when she went into the library. And then she comes out and then she sees the guy. The guy sees her. Then the, the heavens open. <laughs> And then they're running. I grew up in that time. I grew up in, 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 in the time where, where, where uh, we made mixtapes. How many of you remember mixtapes? Mixtapes. And, and CDs. For those of you who are younger, you made CDs of the songs that your heart meant, but your voice could not really hold. You know what I mean? So we made those mixtapes. Um, my son is going to grow up in a time when he literally has to propose to the girl he wants to take on to, to prom. It's like a whole exhibition. And when, that's, when she finally agrees, because my son is cute like his mom, what choice does she have? Um, there's going to be a photo shoot to seal said event. These things are crazy happening right now. But that's the world he's growing up. He's going to grow up in an era where his marriage proposal budget eclipses um, wedding ceremony budget, his parents' wedding ceremony budget, just for the proposal. He's going to grow up in an era where um, um, the gender reveal party, the budget for that, is going to eclipse everything we paid in his first year of school. That's the world. We found a way somehow to show love. We found a way to show that we, we care about something, we found methods, we've made sound, um, signs that we give to other strangers to hold up because we want to propose to somebody at the airport. We write songs, um, 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 we, we show up, we make a video and, and share with our 318 um, IG f f f followers. We, we found ways to show that we love somebody, you know what I mean? But it's interesting because when those very same adults who risk, who risk being shot by the, the father of the girl they were playing the music for, when those very people fall in love with Jesus, they do everything but tell the next person that they're in love with Jesus. We forget the skills that we had. We forget the way we publicized our affection for a human being. Uh, it is interesting because the same hand that cannot wait at half a chance to show their engagement ring when they're having a conversation does not go up during the, the worship service. The same voice that, that says yes when the lady says yes to your proposal and everybody in the restaurant now knows that you propose, you cannot wait. She's my wife, she's my, everybody has to know that's my girl, that's my babe. The same voice that is raised and disturbs everybody's meal, it cannot be raised in church. We can live beside our neighbors for 10 years and they don't know that we love Jesus. We seem to forget. Why don't you just turn to the neighbor that you don't like and say, what happened to you? What happened to you? What changed? That's a, what changed? What changed? What changed? Where is the love? 
Christianity following Jesus is really not about rules and regulations. It's a love story. The Bible actually is just a love story between God and man. And God began this love story. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says that God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were sinners. So that means God has been screaming, I love you since he created Adam. God has been screaming, I love you. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us. Verse 5 says this, this is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. I like the way the, 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 the message says it. He says this, long before he laid down earth's foundations, he had us in mind and settled on us as the focus of his love. God has been standing at the window of eternity, holding his boombox, screaming, I love you. God has been passing notes since Adam all the way down to you. Notes that says, will you love me the way I love you? Because I loved even before you were born. And he's hoping that you choose him. Bible says that God is love. First John chapter 4 verse 16. So not only did he begin this love story, he is the personality. He personifies love. So that means God being loved by his very nature, he is the expert in love. Man, especially man that does not have Christ in him, cannot define love. Why? Jeremiah 17 verse 9. Man is deceptive. And desperately wicked. What does desperate wickedness mean? It means you cannot wait to do something bad. Your body is like, ooh, I cannot wait. You cannot wait to do something bad. That's how the Bible says the heart, especially a heart that does not like Jesus, does not have Jesus, is desperately wicked. The Bible says in 1 John 4 verse 10, it says this is real love. Not that we loved God. We don't define love. We don't originate love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. That's what love is. It begins with God. Our best bet then to understand love is to look at the one who is love. Nobody, short of God, can define what love is. The Bible says in John chapter 15 verse 13 that there is no greater love than a man to lay down his life for his friends. That word there is agape. That word there is agape. Agape is a kind of love. It means this. That Greek, Greek, Greek word there means to take pleasure in a thing, to welcome with desire, to prize it above other things, to have a preference for to be unwilling to abandon something or to do without it. Agape is God's kind of love. And this agape love is a kind of love that is not concerned with itself. It's seeking and it's more concerned with the greater good of the person that it loves. This agape is not born out of emotions or feelings or familiarity or attraction. It's born out of the will and a choice. This kind of love is the love that says, I choose to love you, not for what you're going to do for me or for who you are to me or the attraction I have for you. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, while we were yet repulsive to God, while there was no reason why God should love us, the Bible says he loved us. He demonstrated his love towards us. That means when God says, I love you, he's saying, I take pleasure in you. I prize you above all things. He's saying, I am unwilling to abandon you or do without you. He's saying, I, I'm welcoming you with deep desire to connect with you. When God says, I love you, he's saying, I have a preference for you. Some of you just need to hear that. God prefers you. God decided to prefer you. Everybody say, God prefers me. Everybody say it like you mean it. God prefers me. Everybody say, God decided to prefer me. So God started this love story. God is love. God set the standard for love by saying, this is the kind of love I want you to have, agape kind of love. And it's interesting because in the Old Testament, the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, the Bible says, God gives them a command. Love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. So spirit, soul, and body. 
Jesus echoes this in Matthew chapter 23, verse 35. It says one of the religious, experts in religious law asked me a question trying to, 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 to entrap him. It says, what's the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So the arrangement for love in the Old Testament was us, all are. It was predicated on us. We decided the extent to which God gave us a command and then he was encouraging us to do it with everything you have on the inside of you. But in the New Testament, Jesus um, switches up, substitutes the machinery of love for God. John chapter 15 verse 9 says this, I have loved you just as the Father has loved me. So he's saying the Father loves me. His love for me is the example and then I exude loves, love just like he loves me. The Bible goes on to say in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, we love because he first loved us. So the example is not all my strength, all my heart, all my mind, all my soul. I now love just as God loves me. So I embrace, that means I have to embrace the love of God to express it. I have to experience the love of God to express it. I have to embrace it to embody it. I have to realize it to reciprocate it, to release it. Uh, um, um, let, me, let me just vent for a little bit. When, when, when I started going out with Pastor Ambi, we started this whole thing, then I told her, I love you. Let's, I, I, I want the record to state that I was the first person to say it. It took her one year to say it back to me. I'm still recovering from that. From it took her one year. Because in every relationship, the second person who says I love you predicates their confidence on the expression of the first. So you say I love you too, because you have a revelation that the, per the person you're saying I love you to has expressed, I, I love you. So you're confident. It is, it's an assurance. I'm not, just, I'm not just out there by myself. I'm out there because you're out there. God is saying I'm, I'm out here. I've been out here from the very beginning. That's right, that's right. I, are you going to join me out here? That's what, just, just watch the way I love you and love me the way that I love you. God's love must be experienced for it to be expressed. So... The question then becomes, how do we respond to this overwhelming display of love? How do we respond? Ah, okay, let me just continue my vent. When I told Pastor Ambi, <laughs> you can notice I'm, I'm, I'm not yet healed from this stuff. When I told Pastor Ambi, I love you, do you know what, you know what she said, what your pastor said? I'll tell you. She said, and I quote, Okay, I acknowledge your love. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's 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 your pastor. That's that's your pastor. Um, just imagine <laughs> going out with somebody for two years and then finally. Um, that you meet one of their friends and you say, oh, I'm, I'm Victor. And, and they go, oh, Victor, yay. Then you realize they, they, they don't know you. <laughs> like, you look at the person you're going out with, they're like, oh, I've not heard, oh, oh we've, we've not heard anything about you, but I've heard everything about you. Why don't... That's how God feels with most of us. Nobody around you knows. When you say, God, they're like, God, which God? Oh, God, Jesus? Oh, Jesus. Like Jesus, Bible, Jesus, Bible, Jesus? Because we don't. I used to be very shy about saying I'm a pastor because you get those weird looks. When you get I'm a pastor, like, Ugh. and then people begin to behave all weird. But now, like, I don't care. And I'm, again, I'm not the standard. It was a journey I had to take. I was like, why am I embarrassed? Why, why, why is it weird? I'm, I'm like, I'm a public speaker. I'm a human development. <laughs> No, this is real. That's what I used to say. That's what I used to say. I'm a human development um, person. You know what I mean? Develop the human capital. I coach. 
But now I'm so confident. Two houses in every direction of our house. Everybody knows I'm a pastor and I don't care. Because I have to be bold about it. So the question for you is who knows you love God? Who knows you love God? I'm not saying those that come to church with you. No, no, no. Those that don't come to church with you. Who knows you love God? So how do we respond to this overwhelming display of love? Number one, our love for God must be heard. Nobody wrote more songs. Nobody expressed their love for God. I don't think in the Bible more than David. David says, Psalms chapter 18, 1 to 2. He says, I love you, Lord. You are my strength. He says, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my savior, my God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, my place of safety. This is actually a song that David wrote. The Bible says he wrote that when he escaped the hands of his enemies and Saul. And he's not just saying, I love you. He's whispering sweet, sweet no, 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 nothings to God. Like when let's say, Yo, you're my protector. Like sometimes when you're just telling somebody you love, it's not just about I love you. No, like, man, I like the way you do this. I like the way you do And he's talking to God and he's saying, you're my protector, you're my shield. It must be heard. When was the last time you sang a love song to God? I, I was thinking about this song this morning. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord, today. Because you care for me. In such a special way, and I'm not on the key, and that's why I praise you, and I lift you up, and I magnify your name. That's why I always sing your praise. You are beautiful beyond description. Too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, ah. like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can fathom, grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom? The depths of your love You are beautiful Beyond Description Majesty And truth Man. We have to get to a point where our love for God can be heard. It makes no sense that every week you have an opportunity to say you love God. To sing. There's a whole group of people and a whole band and a whole investment that goes into facilitating worship for you. And you're just a spectator. If you're in a good relationship, you can't go too long without saying I love you. The person just wants to hear it. Like, I'm, I'm actually learning, still learning how to do that because the kind of person I am, I'm so consistent. I'd be like, the last time I told you I loved you, nothing has changed. <laughs> if something changed, I'll let you know. I'll, I'll, I'll update the status. But I'm learning. You have to just say it every once in a while. Send a text. It has to be heard. Everybody said the love of God was heard. So my love for God has to be heard. Everybody say, God, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Holy Spirit, I love you. Why don't you just turn to the, your, your neighbor, the one you like this time, and say, I love God. I love God. I love God. So, do you love God? <laughs> What's wrong with you? Um, so at the well, we are committing to saying and expressing our love for God as often and as loudly as possible. 
At the well, we love God. At the well, our love for God is going to be heard in our worship, be it corporate or personal. Our love for God has to be in our everyday lives. Our love for God has to be seen in the rooms and on the road. Our love for God has to be seen in secrets and on the streets. Our love for God has to be seen when we're on vacation and when we're in our vocation. Our love for God has to be heard. At the well, we love God loudly. Everybody say, I love God. Most of you don't get say, I love God. Yes. So number two, our love for God must be seen. Oh, now something happened on Sunday. Joel had a game. Joel plays well. He plays um, soccer. Had a game um, Sunday night. We had one in the afternoon, Sunday afternoon, then Sunday evening he had a game. Then on the way back, Pastor Ambi, I'm coming for Pastor Ambi today because I'm venting. <laughs> Don't mind me. But something happened, beautiful thing. She called me and she said, um, something happened. Somebody during the game hit Joel on the head and then I ran. And I stopped shy of getting on the field. Is that okay? I said, did anybody say it's not okay to you? No. Then you're fine. You're okay. But your love for somebody will have you doing crazy things. Have a pastor, forgetting she's a pastor, and running to upper court another child. <laughs> you know what I mean? They make you do crazy things. Love for somebody will make you be snoring on the phone because you don't want to end the call. Love, love for God will have you dressing up and they're just on the phone hearing you ruffle through your clothes. Are you there? Yes, I'm there. Okay. <laughs> Crazy things. Love for God will make you giving your last McDonald's fry to another human being. Not in the offering box to another human being. You give your last fry. Love for God will make you give somebody your last wing, the flat one, the, your last one. With all the sauce in it. Love will make you do crazy stuff. Love will make you give your last guac to somebody. Now you have to chew your last chip dry. Now you're about to choke because you gave. <laughs> oh my God. Love will have you do crazy things. Love will have you. One of my friends just got married. You left for the wedding with locks, came back without locks. I was like, ooh, okay. Love will have you doing crazy things, wearing skinny jeans because your wife likes skinny jeans and you cut off this blood circulation to your legs because you... <laughs> oh my God. Love will have you looking for an open chick fil a on a Sunday. <laughs> love will have you doing crazy things because love has to be seen. Love has to be expressed. Psychologists actually believe in a group of people. You can tell who's attracted to who just by the way they behave. They laugh louder by the jokes. Like, jokes are not funny. <laughs> well, it's not that serious. It's really not what happened. But it has to be seen. God loves us, and his love for us is so crazy. And permit me to use the word that he sends his only son to die for us. Like, there's no spare son. There's no, like, if you die, this stuff doesn't work. There's no... And he did not die with the assurance that we're going to accept him. He's not like a human being. So I'm about to help you guys. Do you guys need help? Then all of us say, yeah, we need help. Then God says, okay, Jesus, go die. They've agreed that when you die, they're going to accept the reason for where you're... There was no assurance. But love will have you doing crazy things without assurance. And the Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 16, that God so greatly loved us dearly, prized the world that he sent his son. The, the, the message says, this is how much God loves the world that he gave his son. God sent Jesus, and Jesus was willing to do the hard thing. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 says, By this we know, and we have come to understand the depths and the essence of the precious love that he was willing to lay down his life for us. This was not easy. The Bible says in the Garden of Gethsemane, his sweat was like blood, droplets of blood. That's how much anguish he was in. He actually begged God, if, if, if there's an alternative, if Angel Mike is interested in this mission, please send Angel Mike. That's just my, 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 my version. That's not what the Bible said. But you get it. He was like, no, I don't want to do this. This is very hard. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2, and walk continually in love, that is, value one another, practice empathy and c compassion, unselfishly seeking the best for others, just as Christ, again, that's the standard, just as Christ also loved you and gave up himself for us as an offering 
and a sacrifice to God slain for me so that it became a sweet fragrance. The sacrifice of Jesus, the demonstration of the love of God for us, rose up to God as a sweet fragrance. Speaking of fragrance, a story comes to mind that is represented in Mark chapter 14, Matthew chapter 26, and John chapter 12. In Mark chapter 14, I like that rendition. Verse 3 says this, Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, who was also previously, he had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. He broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. Some at the table were indignant. And why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. It could have well been sold for a year's wage and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her harshly. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? Ah, you will always have the poor among you. And you can help them whenever you want to. But you will not always have me. She has done this. She has done what she could. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth. Wherever this good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deeds will be remembered and discussed. This is a different story from the one in Luke chapter 7. It's a different Simon, a different town, a different action by the woman, a different response by Jesus, a different response by the audience. But in this story, if we put together the account in Matthew, Mark, and John, we have the following. Jesus is eating at the house of a former leper. The Bible is very clear to say he's a former leper. Aren't you glad that Jesus doesn't deal with you based on your past? He deals with you based on your present. He's not looking at what you used to be. He's looking at what you are now. So he's dealing with you. In those days, you could not have close relationship with a leper. But Jesus was like, your past is gone. I'll deal with you like your past is gone. Man sometimes finds it very difficult to let the past go. But we have a God that once he forgives you, he forgets it. It's gone. The Bible says it falls into the sea of forgetfulness. So we have a woman that John chapter 12 identifies as Mary, the sister of Lazarus. Who was brought back from the dead? When he says, Lazarus, rise. That's that sister, Mary. So she breaks open the seal of an alabaster box, this stone box. She breaks the seal and pours this um, expensive perfume on her. John chapter 12, in John's account, he says that Mary took a pound of this ointment of pure liquid nard, a rare perfume that was very expensive, and she poured it on Jesus' feet. So if you put all accounts together, she pours it on the head of Jesus, she pours it on Jesus' feet, and the Bible says she uses her hair to wipe it. So everyone in the room saw the value she had for Jesus. And if you did not see it, you smelt it first. And then you, 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 you looked for where the smell was coming from. And then you saw it. I, okay. Have you ever like come into a room and then you have like a, a, a cologne just hits you in the face. Beautiful. Just smacks you in the face. And then all of a sudden somebody's talking to you like, wait, who is the person? Who is the, who, who are, who's, who's wearing this? Or have you ever hugged somebody before and then you leave their presence and your whole hair, your whole, ev- everything about you, you live with them. Essentially, they are, they're following you around. When this woman showed her love for Jesus... The Bible says she wiped it with her hair. What does that mean? She began to smell the way Jesus smelled. When you show your love for God, you live with the essence of God. Your sacrifice of worship, whatever is on God comes on you. Whatever is anointing is on Jesus comes on you. And guess what? The Bible says that the room was filled with the smell. If you want your office... To be filled with the essence of God, what do you do? Express your love in that space. Not only do you leave smelling like Jesus, that whole room begins to smell like Jesus. Get to work early and say, I love you, Lord. You're wonderful. You're beautiful. And you begin to smell like Jesus. The office, they come in, they'll be like, hey, what, what, what's happening? This is different. This space is different. Yes, this is how God smells. This is how the glory of God is. The Bible says the room, nobody could deny that she loved Jesus. When she left, wherever she went, to, like, you're smelling really awesome. Wait, that's the same cologne, that's the same perfume that's on Jesus. Yeah, I spent some time with Jesus. That's why I smell like him. And this was no cheap perfume. The Bible says that the CFO of the Jesus Evangelistic Ministries, Judas Iscariot, said we could sell this perfume 
for a year's wage. Let's, let's do some math. Let's bring it into our, our, our context. Minimum wage is about $15. Let's round it up. $15 per hour. For a 40-hour week, that's like 600 bucks. For a 52-week year, that's $31,200. This woman poured $31,200 on Jesus in one sitting. Now, you're like, oh, that's the Bible. That's not really what God is saying. That was minimum wage. That was not your yearly salary. But this was not her first time giving her all. John chapter 11, when she comes and she sits at the feet of Jesus, Martha is doing what Martha is doing. And she sits and she gave all her attention to Jesus. So it was easy for her to give all her money to Jesus because that Jesus had already had all her attention. The reason why it's difficult for, okay, I said I wasn't going to talk about money. Let me just go talk about money and come back real quick. The reason why it's difficult for us to part with our money, I didn't plan to say this, so don't say like I, I didn't plan to say it. Part with our money for God, kingdom projects, things that concern God, is because he doesn't have our full attention. Because it's only the person that has your full attention that has access to your full account. Because you have to have my attention first. John chapter 11, she gives her entire attention. She didn't even care if Jesus was hungry. Martha was like, Jesus is hungry. Make this, make that. He was like, no, I just, I want to hear you talk. I want to sit at your feet. And Jesus said, you've chosen the better thing. So it's no surprise that John says that's the exact same woman that gave all of her attention, giving all, giving this expensive thing. At the well, we are going to love God sacrificially. Even when it hurts, we're going to love God. We're not just going to love God loudly. Sidebar, is not her sitting attentively, listening to Jesus, that got her story intertwined with the story of Christ? Is her sacrificial giving that Jesus said, wherever my story is told, her story will be told. There are people that God is waiting on to just sacrifice. I have this impact. I want to intertwine your name with my name forever. But most of us are too, 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 we have a hold on our sacrifice. That God says, if you release it, I will tie your name to my name forever. Anywhere that my name is mentioned, your name will be mentioned. Anywhere that glory is given to me, I will share some of that with you because of your sacrifice. That's why he's called the God of Abraham. Because of his sacrifice. So we're going to love God loudly. Uh, because our, our love for God has to be seen. We're going to love God sacrificially because our love for God has to be heard, has to be seen. And number three, our love for God must be known. One of the biggest challenges or the biggest tests of love, one of the, the tests of love occurs when you have an opportunity to break the commitments that you have made. That's when there's a test. The Bible says, uh, John chapter 14 verse 15, if you love me, Jesus is saying, obey my commandments. If love is not tested, it cannot be trusted. If love is not tried, we cannot be certain that it is true. John chapter 14 verse 21, the NLT says, Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. It goes on to say in verse 23, Jesus replied, All who love me will do what I say. 1 John 5 verse 3 says, Loving God means keeping his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. They're not too heavy. The greatest sign of love for God is your obedience to him and his word. Amen. Not how loudly you shout it. Not how much you come to church. That usually ends up being a result of obedience. The Bible says don't forsake the gathering of, of, of brethren, the fellowship of brethren. But he said the greatest way I will know that you love me is by your obedience. And I don't think any story exemplifies, especially obedience in when nobody's watching. 
The story of Joseph is a classic example. Joseph is sold into slavery in Egypt because of his big mouth. He has a dream that meant that the brothers were not doing well. He was doing well. They sold him into slavery. He gets into that land and he becomes a slave of one of, an, of, of the Egyptian officers, Potiphar. God favors him and whatever Potiphar gives him to do flourishes. He's doing very well. Everything is going well until Potiphar's wife looks at him, takes a liking to him, and the Bible says every day she was making the same request. We pick up the story in verse 8. And Joseph refused and said to his wife, Look, with me in this house, my master does not concern himself with anything. He has put everything that he owns in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am. (laughs) Nor has he kept anything from me except you. Everybody needs to know their limits. You need to know the line that you cannot cross. Don't let the power get into your head and you think everything is up for grabs. No, power has responsibility. Power has a limit to it. Say, because you're his wife. Then how could I do this great evil and sin against God and against your husband? Now, let let me give some context. Joseph is a slave in a foreign land. There are no synagogues. There are no churches. There is no small group. There is no dream team. There is nobody to hold him accountable to the values he was living with in his father's house. There was no law given yet. The Ten Commandments had not been given yet. He was going by word of mouth what his great-grandfather agreed with God that was passed from one generation to the other. He was in a foreign land and yet his love for God could not be moved. Nobody was watching him to see, oh, you have to adapt. When in Rome, behave like the Romans. And when Egypt, we have to do it. No. He said, no, I love God. He was willing to upset and lose the favor of his master's wife. Now, the master probably went to work. The fact that she can do this freely means the man is not always home. That means he's spending more time with this woman. And you're like, I'm going to be in trouble for rejecting her. He does not care if he has to go to jail. And in fact, he goes to jail because his love for God compelled him to stand his ground. I'm not going to live a double life. The life that I have outside is going to be the life that I have inside. The life that I have in the DMs is going to be the life that I have in broad daylight. The life that I have on vacation is the life I'm going to live when I'm back home. The life that I have when I go on a work trip is going to be the life I have when I'm with my family. The life I have behind closed doors is the life I'm going to have when the doors are open. The life that I have when I'm, when, when, when I'm with my supervisor It's going to be the same life I have when he's not watching me. I'm not going to just move my mouth and he's going to say that I'm walking when I'm not walking. (laughs) Let's add some Bible to that. Colossians chapter 3 verse 23. Work willingly at whatever you do as though your supervisor was God rather than your boss. That's, it says, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. <laughs> so it says, work as if the person who is going to do your annual review is God. Okay, let me back out of there so you guys don't get upset and wait for me in the lobby. Ephesians 6 verse 7 says, work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord rather than people. The, 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 the MSG says, servants, respectfully obey your earthly masters but always with an eye to obeying the real master, Christ. Don't just do what you have to do to get by. Work heartily as Christ's servants, doing what God wants you to do. And work with a smile on... (laughs) Oh, Bible, man. Work with a smile on your face. He didn't say you have to like it. He just says work with a smile on your face. Always keeping in mind that no matter what happens... To be given, no matter who ever happens to be given the orders, you are really serving God. Loving God means I live by a set of values, the same set of values, regardless of what, whatever situation I find myself. Whether somebody's watching, somebody's not watching, my love for God is going to be bold, it's going to be unreserved. Wherever I find myself, at the well, we love God and we want people to know that we love God. We don't have a secret affair with God. 
God is not a side chick. God is not a side guy, side boo. He's a God by himself, and he will not be treated as number two. He will not be hidden. He says, I want everybody to know. I want it to be known wherever you live, whatever space and place you go into, people need to know that I love God boldly. I love God unashamedly. Everybody say, I love God. No, say it like me. Say, I love God. So what should our response be to this overwhelming display of love? Our love for God must be heard. Our love for God must be seen. Our love for God must be known. I'm going to end with this story. And, and, And the worship team can come out. Just gonna worship. Is that the key? Lord, I love you more than anything. Uh, my son had a, a he, he plays for a he plays for a different soccer team than I cheer for. I'm a fan for. And his love for God for his team can be seen, can be heard when he's arguing with me. Because my son can argue with people who can physically disintegrate him. <laughs> he doesn't care. You will know what team he supports, what team he plays for. God has given us the favor. He plays for the academy of a really big team in England. And um, he will tell you. And he will be shady. If my team ever loses, he, pff, I'm finished. And you can, see, you, you can see his love when he wears the jerseys and he's all kitted up and he has different wares. He's proud about it. Recently, I came to know the love he has for this team. My son has been dabbling. Joe has been dabbling in graphic design for, for a bit. So you take a picture, then edit the picture. So one day, he picked up the crest, the badge of my team and really did something special. It was beautiful. I was like, wow, bro, this is, this is great. I was like impressed. I was like, Okay, 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 okay. Because I do some graphic design. I was like, okay, I see. Let's a little, okay, we can work with this. So I'm really impressed. And the night was like, man, I did another one. You want to see? So this time around in the evening, he had done the crest of his own team, Liverpool. I support I'm Arsenal. He supports Liverpool. <laughs> so he shows me the crest of Liverpool. And then I wanted to compare what he did for his team with what he did for my team. I began to swipe. I said, ah, it's, it's not this long now. It's not this far. I said, where, where is the, the one you did for Arsenal? <laughs> <laughs> he, he had d- deleted it. <laughs> he, he didn't make a public show of it. Like he didn't need somebody watching him to prove that he likes his team. Behind closed doors, without spectacle, with no watching eyes, he kept the same values. Like, how will I have this man's team on my phone? (laughs) Delete for forever. And he showed his loyalty when nobody was watching. My question for you is, who knows that you love God? Publicly, and then behind closed doors, do you know, does your life show that you love God? Because that's something that separates us corporately and individually as well. If this has blessed you, just put your hands together and celebrate God.